Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. I'm Russell. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks very much, Matt, for inviting me to participate at this meeting. And thanks all of you for being here. And those of you that are new, welcome. And those of you that are struggling, welcome everyone, really. It's no real categorization. We're all just here, aren't we? We're all just trying to not drink and probably in the case of some of us not take drugs one day at a time. I am, um, like for me, the 12 step program, the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, having a sponsor, belief in a higher power reading the literature and sponsoring other people is the foundation and platform for my life. It's my, um, it's my sort of belief system without it. I, I don't think I would get very far for very long, not just talking about like uh, alcohol and drugs, even to be honest, although, you know, I came into this because of alcohol and drugs, but I reckon I could have done this program when I was a little kid tell you the truth like when I was about I don't know when did I first like I don't know about you but I feel like the um qualities or traits should we say of alcoholism were present long before I started drinking like the way that I um ate chocolate was pretty obsessive like the sort of general fretful nervousness I had as a little boy in fact I remember I was lucky enough to go to a 12-step treatment centre and when I read my life story to um, the man that would become my first sponsor uh, who ran that treatment centre, like he, like when he read that that um, life story, he went, poor, he went, oh, poor, lonely little boy, like that. And I sort of felt like that, that verdict didn't even just apply to me as a child, but sort of somehow applied to me as an adult. And it would be difficult to say that was a man at that stage. 18 years ago because I was still in a sense arrested and held in the kind of um, the suspension of this condition if like step 12 says having had a spiritual awakening as a result of this these steps that kind of indicates that the problem that we and was in fact the lack of a spiritual awakening that sort of seems like a weird thing to say, doesn't it? If like if you're right there on the front line, couple of days out, still rattling or just struggling to get through a day without drinking or using. But in a way, it's kind of obvious because why do you know what is drinking and using about? It's, for me, it was about trying to change the way that I felt. It was about trying to achieve a sense of connection. <laughs> It was about trying to deal with feelings of loneliness, inferiority, inadequacy, and also fear. All these things are spiritual conditions that are applicable way beyond people that go on to develop issues with drugs and alcohol. But I think for those of us that are alcoholics and identify as alcoholics, we simply can't exist without addressing these conditions. So... At the beginning of it, I reckon the way that, you know, you can't ruin your life as quickly with wagon wheels and penguin biscuits and Twixes as you can with drugs and alcohol, but you can really mess with your self-esteem. You can't ruin your life as quickly with pornography as you can with crack and heroin, but I've damaged myself with all of those things or even uh, sexual relationships, codependency. What I feel grateful for in the case of having this program is that I've been granted a, a, a whole system for living. I came into this program because I couldn't cope with life. I couldn't cope with who I am. I couldn't cope with how I felt. I'll tell you some basic things about me drinking and using if you want. I'm also sort of like leafing through the big book, you know, the foundational document of this program. There are like loads of us, particularly if you, I didn't want to read this sort of stuff when I first came in. You know, I was really pretty bloody keen to avoid it firstly for the big book i didn't like the like the language 
I mostly also, I didn't really want to stop drinking and using drugs. I knew it was a problem. I could see that my life was deteriorating. I could see that things were sort of quickly getting worse. It was really plain for me. Towards the end of my drinking, I was getting arrested a lot, hospitalised a lot. Relationships that I cared about were ending. My self-esteem, like, I don't know, man. Everything was held in drugs and alcohol. But, like, I still didn't really want to stop. And then when I came in, when I came into this programme, I sort of wanted to do the bare minimum. That was my sort of plan. Do the bare minimum. Attend. I went to these meetings because I really recognised and learned from going to that treatment centre that I needed this. I knew that I couldn't drink or take drugs again. Although I must say that when I very first went into a treatment centre, what I thought was I'd buy myself like a month or two and then I can get back on it. That's what I thought. Like things that had got out of hand. Anyone could see that. And those of you that, um, you know, have got problems with alcohol, and I guess that includes all of us, We'll know that sort of towards the end, towards the end of my drinking and using, the problems started to collapse into one another. You know, like it, it, there were the time between serious incidents was getting shorter and shorter. They were stacking up, buffeting against one another. Like when I think about it nowadays, it's not like in the average week, there won't be like, you know, a fight, a visit to a hospital, people crying their eyes out losing a job getting a smack in the mouth that's not like a sort of a daily experience to live like that for me anymore now my life's sort of pretty in most respects i would say pretty ordinary i've got children i've got dogs i try and just stay out of trouble this is the platform of my life the forefront of my life prayer meditation attending meetings yeah but before when i was drinking and using it was the chaos was visible the chaos was present i wouldn't have thought that what i was lacking was a spiritual solution i felt what i needed was um lots of drugs lots of sex lots of money lots of approval power distance from people control over my situation and this program sort of really showed me that I didn't know anything. The only thing I really knew actually thinking about it was that there was something I needed to dedicate myself to something I needed to devote my life to. But I thought that what that was, was drinking and using. I was very committed to that. It's weird, isn't it? When we first hear, or certainly when I first heard a lot of the principles from this program, you know, just even as exemplified by the steps, you know, one, I was powerless over alcohol. My life would become unmanageable. Yeah, I had no problem with that. And in fact, it's pretty easy to come up with examples, like when you wake up in places and you don't know how you got there, when you're in cells, when there's the drama of physical injury, when you're starting fights that you've got no way of getting out of, um, when you've harmed other people in your life, when you've done things that you wouldn't normally do, when you've said that you're going to stop doing it and you just can't stop. That's a really good way of understanding powerlessness. And another thing that I think is crucial to uh, powerlessness and unmanageability is the first step states, you know, we, uh, uh, we admitted we were powerless over our... Is once I start drinking and using, I don't know what will happen. I don't know what will happen. Uh, that's still in me now with 18 years clean and sober one day at a time in other areas because I've like I've moved my madness a little bit further away from me. I haven't moved it. It's been moved away from me by working this program. But for example, like I had never bought any clothes online ever. I just didn't get around to it. I didn't buy clothes online. About like 10 days ago, I bought like a hoodie online. And then the next day I bought another hoodie online. And then the next day I bought another hoodie online. Then like buying hoodies online, that's suddenly my game, right? It's still in there lurking, waiting, the powerlessness and the unmanageability. Obviously, I can't, you know, ruin civilization by buying hoodies in the same way that I can by you know, buying crack and heroin. So, so the powerlessness and unmanageability is recognizable. I don't have any power over things. I'm best if I stay within the lines drawn by certain principles the second step came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity i didn't think that was possible for a long long time and i know a lot of people don't think it's possible i know a lot of people think that there's something wrong with them that they're dirty that they're tainted i've never spoken to an alcoholic at length and not learned that deep down they were ridden with fear that they were not good enough that they were somehow tainted and dirty and if people really knew you for who you are they wouldn't like you everyone I've ever spoke to says that and that's what I know sense. I was sort of chatting to some mates of mine before this and they said oh look there's loads of people on this meeting oh there's a thousand people on the meeting for me it don't make no difference anymore like 
when I go into me, when there was physical meetings, you know, and I'm lucky enough that in my area in England, there's still some regulated support groups that I can attend my home group, you know, like, I used to feel a bit nervous going into me. I don't want to go to me. And the first one I went to when I was 18 years old, I hated it. I thought, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like people giving out birthday cakes, singing songs, wanting a cuddle. Like that was before the pandemic. So like, you know, I wanted people at arms then, even then. But like now, what I think is, is if you're at this meeting, you must to some degree be the same as me, unable to cope with life without coming here. That if you don't come here, if you don't work a program, you're going to drink or use and you're going to hurt yourself and you're going to hurt the people around you and you're going to become someone that you don't want to be. That's, I know that. So for me, it doesn't matter if there's 10 people or 10,000 people in this fellowship, in this program, we are united at the point of our shared wound. This shared wound, I believe to be an absolute urgency and necessity for the spiritual experience. In fact, it don't matter what I believe. That's what he says in the literature, that we need to have a spiritual awakening. <sighs> the way that I have begun to understand and receive this spiritual awakening is by attending regular meetings, having a sponsor, sponsoring people, reading the literature, praying and meditating, and working my way through the steps. Part of the spiritual awakening came when I stopped drinking and using and I, the fear, the rush of fear and dread and terror and horror that dawned on me and like the sort of feeling my childhood again for a second time, you know, same as everything in this program, I'll be around the middle here. You know, there'll be people here that had worse childhoods than me, not as bad childhoods, used worse than me, didn't use as badly, didn't drink as much. Um, but I, I'm roughly in the middle and people with more time, clean and sober people with less time clean and sober i'm happy being a bog standard regular alcoholic because it means do you know why because it means that what works for alcoholics will work for me and it's so wonderful to have a solution it does take a lot of work and a lot of dedication devotion in fact this program is now the most important part of my life what i mean by that is every decision i make and the way that i look at the world is entirely um conditional on this program it's not like i do this program a little bit and then go with my life in fact i'll tell you something any area of my life that i try to keep separate from this program becomes problematic if i say i'll have my sex life separate from this program i won't work these principles in that area of my affairs then it becomes problematic if it's my work then that area becomes problematic if it's my eating then that area becomes problematic and in the literature, I think it's pretty clear that it's saying that, yes, we start off removing whatever substance is destroying us. My mum had this terrible accident like a couple of years back, nearly died, broke her back, broke her neck, burst open her, her bowel. She was going to like, and when I was at the Royal London Hospital near where it, where it happened, the surgeons said, like, well, the first thing you have to do is sort that back half hour. Then we'll move on to these back injuries and these neck injuries. One by one, they work their way through and you know thank god my mum survived due to you know god and the excellence of these various professionals and it's the same with us i believe first we remove the alcohol and the drugs you could kill yourself in an afternoon with that if you're serious about it then you have to look at what's causing this and i don't even mean the behaviors necessarily the behavior around food or the behavior around sex or the behavior around work or gambling or codependent relationships where you get in relationships with people and you repeat the pattern again and again and again and you treat them as a higher power what i mean most of all is this sort of set of beliefs that we have within us somehow like it says in the literature that happiness can be wrought from this world that that if the that the world can give us satisfaction like that what I've been shown is that it cannot, that we don't know. I don't know what's best for me. I don't know what I want. I, I thought I knew what I wanted. I rushed face first into becoming a drug addict and an alcoholic. It seemed like the sort of thing that might sort of solve the problem of me. It seemed culturally what I was being presented with. And I treated it like a religion. I did it every day all day and I prioritized it above all else people went oh if you keep doing this you're going to lose this job no problem if you're going to keep doing this you're going to lose this relationship fair enough this friendship's over these opportunities all these things like most of us I'm sure this applies to every single one of you 
we have abilities, we have insight, we have sensitivity. Sensitivity is a kind of intelligence, an awareness. We bludgeon this awareness into a kind of submission. Yes, through our uh, dependency on substances, you know, inclusive of alcohol, but also we live in a set of strategies that prevent us from evolving. The, I'm talking here about the defects of character, the defects of character that I only understand because I've worked the steps and I've inventoried this process. You know, first I've admitted I was powerless over drugs, alcohol and everything, and then my life would become unmanageable. And that can still happen if I get obsessive about anything. Two, I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. That meant there's something, firstly, there's a lot bagged up in there, isn't there? That there's something that's bigger than you, more important than me, something that can change me. Someone who's super smart that I really admire in this program said, you can say what you want about step two, but really, most basically, all it means is it can move you from drinking to not drinking. That's all this power greater than, you, than yourself has to do, move you from drinking every day to not drinking every day. And me, in 2002, end of that year, drinking and drugs every day, every day, every day. And, you know, from December the 12th to December the 13th, something happened. Some power greater than myself changed me. And one day at a time since then, I've not drank or used drugs. Loads of things have happened to me since then. Mental, crazy, mad things. Some good, some bad, some terrible, some awful, so, some so fantastic. But one thing I knew for certain because of step one is one day at a time, I don't drink or use drugs. The option has been removed. It's become a compound four. The two ideas have been bound together in my mind. If I drink and use drugs, it's over. It's over because now I'm not in the same situation I was in when I came into here. I've like now, it's like I think, hold on a minute, I could just sneak off. Like, you know, my kids are nearly asleep. My missus thinks I'm doing an AA meeting. I could slip off. I don't live that far from places like Slough and Reading where you could score in an easy half hour. I used to use a lot with um, street sleepers. Like, you know, like an, like a, that would be my sort of little way in if I was moving around a little bit. You know, but I have conceded to my innermost self that I am alcoholic. There is no part of me that doubts it. It could be more problematic in other areas of my life to make those concessions when we're talking about impulses and drives that are natural. Like it says in the 12 and 12, instincts gone awry, natural to want status, natural to have a, a sexual drive, natural to want to eat food and to compete. But when these instincts cause us to hurt other people, we need to have a serious look at them. Having become teachable in step three, made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood God. Initially, I understood God to be this system the people that are in the groups that I'm a member of, the 12 step, uh, the Alcoholics Anonymous meetings that I attend. But now I do believe in God. I feel really, really held. My belief in God is the most important thing in my life. My sponsor, he's an atheist. He's like an amazing person, brilliant, brilliant man, doesn't believe in God at all. But like he lives like he believes in God. What I mean is he lives by principles, he prioritizes love, he treats people with respect. Me, I love the romanticism and the poetry of a God who cares what I think about God because it says, you know, God of our own understanding. So we can have, you know, we can have our own high power and what you think is your game and mine is mine. The inventory stuff showed me that the real problem, that of course alcohol is a massive problem, of course it is, but the real problem was me. That was the real problem. I heard someone say in a meeting once, I'm addicted to myself addicted to my own ego, addicted to my own desires, my own wants. What does the wanting want? What does it want? You've given it drugs, you've given it alcohol, you've given it sex, you've given it all sorts of things. All these things I've thrown on the fire of my alcoholism. None of it has worked for me. None of it has led me to anything except for more suffering. What is it this wanting? What is it looking for? Well, our program suggests, states in fact, that what it's looking for is a spiritual experience. What do we mean by spiritual experience? Well, there's some pretty basic principles, service, compassion, kindness, love for yourself and love for other people. It speaks very clearly about the solution throughout the text that I've got on my lap now, some sort of, I don't know if it's a particularly old or special edition, but every version of this book, if you ask me, is Magnificent. I mean, it's a bit dodgy that there's a chapter called To Wives, but hey, this was the 1930s. It was crazy days, crazy days then. They were, you know, they used words like John Barleycorn and stuff to describe booze. It was a mental time. But this, like, the thinking and ideas, philosophies in this program, that's what I build my life around now. Well, not always. Sometimes I like throw it right out of the window and things go wrong fast. Like, you know, like, 
what I'm saying to you now in this situation, knowing there's a lot of people listening, is this is the ideal way to work this program. Me, I make mistakes every single day. I wake up, I don't leap out of bed clicking meals and thinking, the PIA, it's another new dawn. I wake up most days thinking, oh, fuck this, what's the point? You know, like a bit angry, even though things are basically all right now. Still, like, think about different ways where I could fuck my life up. But I don't trust my own thinking anymore. I no longer see my thinking as, um, this is who I am, these thoughts. I see my thoughts kind of as the first layer of the outside world. I don't control what goes on in there. I think all sorts of mad shit. As long as I don't act on it, I'm all right. What I do, I get up, I pray, and I meditate as I was instructed to. I learned the third step prayer, the seventh step prayer, the St. Francis prayer, the Lord's prayer. I recite them mentally. I do transcendental meditation, but there are other forms of meditation that work, you know, I'm sure just as well. I do that every day. Every day. I have to. I do, I like, I live in accordance with this program. I try and like, you know, like it's in that just for today card, you know, try, like, try and help try and help someone every day without being found out not easy to do that is it like um you know dress becomingly all of that stuff you know like this program is loaded with principles that i have over time learned to use instead of my natural tendencies towards self centeredness and self destruction over time it's changed over the time i've been changed the best bits about it for me are other people i think alcoholics are some of the most beautiful people in the world not when they're using and drinking they're an enormous pain in the ass i don't like having alcoholics and drug addicts stay around my house i had one round here the other day like they didn't put the weetabix away the weetabix looked like it had its head kicked in at a bus stop but i do like i i love you people this is what I'm about. People that have acknowledged, oh, there's a gap in us. There's a hole in us. And the only thing that can fill this void within us is a connection to God, God of your understanding, which for me lives, means living by certain principles, praying and meditating, being of service, staying aware. Let me just whiz through the rest of them steps and whoever's in charge of telling me to shut up, I'm sure you'll, you'll just do that, right? You'll just slam right in there and tell me to shut up. So like when it's necessary. Uh, I've done the first three steps. The first three steps should be able to be done by nodding your head. Yes, I'm fucked. Two, it's possible to not be fucked. Three, I'm not going to unfuck myself. Piece of cake, really. should take about that long. Step four takes ages. You've got to write down a whole bunch of stuff. Step five, you share it with another person. Amazing, though, to do that. I felt that shame, the shame, the dirtiness, the worthlessness that I know stalks you as it stalks me. I felt it begin to lift. It can come back sometimes, the feeling, oh, I've done things that are unforgivable and things have been done to me that are unforgivable, that taint me. Like most of you, I've experienced abuse in my childhood of you know, like some of you, again, will have had it much worse. Some of you maybe haven't had it at all. Bloody common, though, isn't it, really? And um, that stuff, it, it taints you. But there's a way back from it through this program. The um, step four gave me an understanding. The step five removed the shame. It removed that idea that if people really knew me, they couldn't love me because I started to feel love for who I really who I really am. Stick six. Is someone saying you have up to a bloody hour? That's absolutely mental. You have up to an hour. Oh, mate, no one needs that, do they? detail essex 1975 midnight the 4th of june a baby's cries rip through the night ah he seems very keen to get to the mother's breast i'm not going to go back that far no one needs that kind of depth do they who needs that sort of detail um uh having a and i've, I've worked all those psychological problems have been they've been resolved now that's that's all way in the past um so like um you know, the one, two, three, pretty easy. I am fucked. I'm not going to be able... I'm fucked. It's possible to not be fucked. On my own, I won't unfuck myself. I'm going to need help. I'm going to need mentorship and guidance. I'm going to need a different way of looking at the world. Step four gave me a vision of how I'd got there. Step five removed the shame. Step six, I looked at what the things were. Like Step six is, you know, became willing to have my defects of character removed. My defects of character are still there. Self-pity. I like take my misery too seriously. I heard once someone say that self-pity is like you sample your misery like wine. Oh, I'm so sad. I'm so sad. Such terrible things have happened to me. Eckhart Tolle says, don't he, um, 
self-pity is the difference between saying if you get cold soup in a restaurant restaurants remember them if you get given cold soup in a restaurant like uh if you like the self-pitying person would say my soup is cold but what we have to learn to say is the soup is cold my soup is cold oh my soup is cold nothing goes right for me my childhood was cold the soup is cold just a simple instruction we don't get married to our misery self-pity pride caring too much about what people think about me being wounded by other people's opinions of me my i can be terrible still now with some time in this program very intolerant intolerant very impatient very greedy very gluttonous jealous envious like these are all strategies for survival, but none of them are successful. None of them will work for me. Step seven, humbly asked for these uh, defects of character to be removed. That's an ongoing thing for me. Now, when I notice myself being jealous or greedy or self-centered, I recognize that there's no solution in that direction. I try to turn my thoughts again to helping others, which, you know, let's face it, it's not bloody easy. Step eight is I made a list of, you know, everyone that I'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Like I've done sort of step nine. Step nine for me, I think is going to be a bit of an ongoing, uh, an ongoing thing. Like I'm sure it is for a, a lot of you guys as well. Um, I've had amazing step nines, the, the amends process. Like I've had people go, oh, you didn't need to do that. You're fine. I was just as bad as you. I've had people say, um, yeah, you really hurt me. Let me tell you the consequences of your actions. I've had people get pissed while I've been doing the step nine with them, sat there drinking, you know, but what it has done is it's worked as an amends should work. Look at this guy. By the way. What, what a lovely boy. Are you a good boy? Yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Oh. I know. Oh, what did you want? Oh, oh no. It's an attack. It's gone out of hand. Good boy. Get back. You sip, soppy sod. So I've made amends where it's appropriate to do so. There's a lot of people who don't want to see me sidling into their life. Step 10 is um, I stay aware. You know, I continue to take personal inventory. I stay aware. Step 11 is through prayer and meditation. I seek a closer conscious contact with a God of my understanding. That's the prayer and meditation. And step 12, having had a spiritual awakening, we carry the message and practice these principles in all our affairs, right? So then last three steps, they're ongoing. I've done the ones up to there. I've done them myself. I've done them with other people. The steps work. Uh, someone said when I was really early on coming into this program and not doing the steps is like checking into a five star hotel and sleeping in the toilet. I like that. I said like, a, like that stayed with me that one. But like, if you do do them, like those of you that are new, I don't know if you're familiar with these things. These are the step nine promises, the promises you hear them in every meeting. Are they going to work for us? Are you going to receive them? If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. So like the step nine is where it starts to get sort of amazing, where you where we start to awaken to who we really are. That's the beautiful thing, I think, actually, about recovery. Someone told me that we recover the person we were intended to be, but we get we go off track. We know that we've all got individual DNA and we know that it can that held in a single seed is the power of the tree that it will become. But of course, a tree unlikely will experience the type of trauma and negative socialization that we experience. A tree just actualizes, unless, you know, someone pours bleach on it or wraps wire around it or whatever. We suffer trauma, we get off track. This program gets us on track. This is what I, this is what I love about this program, the optimism, the optimism that we are beautiful, that we're not fuck ups, we're fundamentally beautiful and we've gone in the wrong direction. We're going to know a new freedom and new happiness. I do know a new freedom and new happiness. Not all the time, not continually, just when I work the steps, then I do know a new freedom and new happiness. We will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. Most of the time, I feel like that. Sometimes I have some regrets. Sometimes I wish I could shut the, part, the, the uh, door on the past. But for me, that normally means there's more work I could be doing. There's some, someone I could be helping. You know, like the way that I used to think when I felt anything, I'm happy. Let's get drunk. I'm saying, like, still now, if I go to a new city, and obviously none of us do that anymore, but I, like, I get this impulse when I arrive in a new city, like, say, like somewhere beautiful, like, like Sydney in Australia, if you've ever been there. Like, sort of like when, when I arrive, I think, oh my God, this place is so beautiful. Let's do some drugs. Like, for some reason, those thoughts are connected in my mind. You know, now, 
if I like any bit of it, I treat stuff that occurs to me like that as information, information I can act upon. I I can change as I was taught by my sponsor and many others. I have the power to intervene in my own thinking today. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. I didn't understand what serenity was. I thought it was boredom. I didn't know that it was possible to even be serene. My whole life I've been either anxious or excited. I've been trying to get drunk or score drugs or have sex or suffering the consequences of not being able to get those things. Didn't know peace at all. Now I know peace. I know it in this moment right now. No matter how farther down the scale we've gone, we will see our experience can benefit others. How beautiful for all that shame and pain and suffering that we have gone through. You know, if any of you that have done service, any of you that have lived the kind of life that's taken you to these places, will be familiar with the lament of people when they're talking to counsellors and probation officers and prison officers and key workers. They will say, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like. Well, me and you, we can say to them, I do know what it's like. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to hate yourself and hate life so much that you want to kill yourself, to be so ashamed, to feel so worthless, to have done things to yourself and others that you can't live with, that you don't want to live with, to use drugs and alcohol in a destructive way. This I know. Now, when people talk to me about wanting to kill themselves or, you know, God forbid, on occasions, people that have lost their lives through taking them themselves or other means, I can have that conversation. I'm not squeamish about it because I know how to live there. It don't matter how far down the scale we've gone. We'll see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. Oh, wouldn't that be a relief to be free of the old feeling of uselessness and self-pity? It goes sometimes. Sometimes it comes back. Right now, I do not feel self-pity. I do not feel useless. I feel that my function is to... um, do this talk in the AA meeting for Camberwell like my mate Matt asked me to. That's it. I don't need to think about it any more than that. I don't need to, you know, you're the same as me. You're here for the same reasons I am. You can't cope with life if you don't come. That's it. We're all here for the same reason. What's the big deal? We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. I do still have some interest in selfish things, but when I work a program, all I want to do is help other people. I become someone that is, is cool to be. Self-seeking will slip away. The brilliant AA speaker Sandy Beach pointed out that the language in the promises is an indication that it's a spiritual rather than a scientific process. Through no scientific or mathematical process would you be told self-seeking will just slip away. Hey, you used to be really self-seeking. What happened to that? I don't know. It just slipped away. Just slipped away. It's all gone now. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. It has done. There was a time when all I cared about was drinking and using drugs sleeping with people it's all i cared about getting money being famous now i don't care and if i do start caring it means i'm feeling ill it means i need to do something it means i need to do something i said to one of my sponsees once and he sort of remembered it it's like that when we um first come into this program it's just like we've got a another one of them like like a rape alarm in our purse but it's like oh no i'm in chaos if you work this program long enough, it's like having security lights at the end of a long, long driveway or having security in high vis. You know, now I notice I'm going crazy if I think I want to eat too much ice cream or if I'm rude to people on the phone or if I start driving like a lunatic. These are early indicators that my life is off track. It's no longer going to be I need drugs, I need alcohol. It's like, oh, I was a bit impolite to my wife then. I was a bit impatient with my children. I wasn't very nice to my dog. These are things out. It's all information. It's all information. Because of this program, I read life. I'm in a kind of a dialogue with reality where I'm continually being sent information. You have to be careful not to go mental, actually, because you can go a bit like uh, too spiritual and start looking for signs all the time and everything. Oh, it's a sign. It's a sign. And then lowering the threshold for what constitutes a sign because you get a bit addicted to signs. I think I could do a few more signs. That bird probably means something. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. It has done. Like, it doesn't mean, as everyone will point out to you, it doesn't mean that economic insecurity will leave you. It just means fear of it will leave you. Just be like, I am held by God. I have a purpose. There's some pretty fundamental ideas start kicking into this program. 
eventually. It's not just about don't drink, don't take drugs. It's about give up who you think you are. It's my life, I'll do what I want. Who told you it's your life and you do what you want? You don't know. We're in limitless space right now in this moment, infinite space in every single direction. In the sub-particular world, there are rules that we can't begin to understand. The laws of physical reality fall apart within the atoms of our own body. We don't know nothing nothing about reality there are certain things though that don't seem transient there are certain things that seem timeless and these things are stitched into the fabric of this pro program acceptance gratitude humility service these ideas come up again and again throughout the great cultures of the world and when these principles are ignored cultures start to fall apart if you don't believe me look out your window we will intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle us that happens sometimes. My dear uncle, he died, you know what I mean? Like, and I went to his funeral yesterday, one of them mad COVID funerals. I went in person, like, but one of his kids was away, like, I'm Zoom, and, like, I got to read a poem at his funeral and that, and I got to be of comfort to my family members who <laughs> knew me when I was a smack and crackhead, knew me at funerals for other people where I was just using at the funeral. And, you know, now I can be relied on. I can be relied on to just not make it about myself, do a reading and that's it. It ain't about me. I just do this reading for my uncle, be of support to other people there. I intuitively knew how to handle that situation that used to happen to me. I'm still an idiot, like sometimes, because I'm a human being and I've still got this mad drive in me, this mad craving that can never really have enough. And I can only really solve it by giving it more God, by giving it more service, by giving it more prayer, meditation, connection. But I do intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I suppose what God could mean in this context is by accepting these principles, by living this new life, by applying the passion and dedication that we used to apply to our drinking and using to this new life. Because it takes a lot of effort, doesn't it, to be an alcoholic and drug addict? I used to give it like, if someone told me I'll turn up at seven Kentish Town West Station, and I'll give you two of each, and then they weren't there at seven. I didn't just go home. I stayed there, and I kept ringing from a phone box, Mark, you, because I'm an old-school drug addict, not like kids today who just press a button on a touchscreen and some lad comes around <laughs> in a Mazda and sticks a couple of bags through the door. I was a drug addict when it was inconvenient to be a drug addict. I needed to it, devoted, and if what I got sold was of negative or dubious quality, I didn't go, oh, well, this doesn't work for me. This cocaine's appalling. I'd call the same person an hour later and say, have you got any more? That seemed to be baking soda. My nose hurts. <laughs> so we are capable of living with faith. We are capable of living with dedication. We are capable of living with devotion. In fact, we have no choice. We've already discovered this about ourselves. The problem is, where do we apply this dedication and devotion? Do we do it according to our own will, according to the accidents of our circumstances, the terrible things we learned? Because people, sometimes people will say, I don't want a program. I'm a free spirit, man. I think you've got a program. You've got a program. You've got the program of your class, your gender, your sex, your race, where you were born, your school, your family. You've been programmed. You don't know who you are. None of us do. That's the reality because there is no self. It's a construct, a series of memories and impulses loosely corralled together, which we mistake as being our reality. But if you do enough step 11, you learn to witness that stuff. You need, And this is all 12, 12, 12, 12 step philosophy. You learn to witness this stuff and realize, oh, that's not even who I am. That's how change is possible. This wasn't who I was in the first place. So that stuff can be relinquished, surrendered, let go of, so that we can become someone worthwhile, someone that is not agony to be. Are these extravagant promises? That's the only bit I sort of really disagree with, because, you know, it goes, we think not, but they're quite extravagant, aren't they? Your entire life is going to fundamentally, we think not, if this was a physical... Think not. But it bloody well is, isn't it? They're being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. Fact is, is I don't want to work for them. Do you? It's a pain in the ass, isn't it? To sort of like sometimes, you know, if you sponsor people, oh, look, there they are phoning up what they want this time. But it's actually quite good because if you sponsor people, you know, they ring you up. As long as the information you give them is from the big book or from 12-step literature of some description, because as I was told early on, if you're listening to someone in this program and what they're telling you ain't, from the big book you're listening to a drunk you know who cares about my opinions and my feelings 
It's just a load of madness. All I've ever proven is that I've got the ability to ruin my own life pretty good. But this program is reliable, can be depended upon. Now, when I pass on that information, when someone asks me, it like asks, how do I handle this situation? What I do is I forget what I think and I think about what it says in this literature or what I've learned from people further down the road than me, my elders, the people that have walked this path ahead of me, and then I pass that information right on to them. And sometimes I hear myself saying, no, that's not how you should treat your partner. Stop making them responsible for your feelings. Take responsibility for yourself. Do the work. Remember that nothing can make you happy. And I don't even mean just alcohol or drugs. I mean, your children can't make you happy. Your parent, nothing can. Only your relationship with your innermost self can provide you with true, lasting happiness. And if you work on that through this program, then you will have good relationship with your children. You will have good relationship. You'll have a chance. And still difficult things will befall you. Still challenges will happen. But at least we know the way out. We know the way out here. So, like me, I try to work this I try to work it as best I can. I try to work work it as it is written and as it is explained to me by people with more experience. I try to let go of my shame and my fear and my self-centeredness. I try to be a useful member of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's all I really, you know, look, I want other things sometimes, but those things don't really work. This works. This is a reliable system. If you're having trouble in your life, see, Sometimes I don't you you know if you've been around this for a long time you'll hear people that say don't work that AA don't work I tried it well there's some questions next time someone tells you they tried AA and it didn't work so say what was your home group how did you work the steps who was your sponsor how often did you pray and meditate these are the things that this program is not to just turn up in a room somewhere there's the program of alcoholics there is the fellowship of alcoholics the program of alcoholics is in this book. And the Fellowship of Alcohol, of Alcoholics Anonymous is in this phone. And well done, those of you that have still got your camera on, because I found it hard to not look at my phone when I was in a meeting. And now that the meeting is in a phone, it's like, fuck this, I'm on the gram. I may not turn you off altogether, but the, the camera's going off. You are doing well. I'm talking about you, Lauren L in the UK. You, Hector. You, Adele. You, Stu and Rob T and Scott. I see you all, Rob, Beverly, Dan, Jay. In fact, I can't see Dan Jay. He slipped off out of frame. Linda and Eric, Tony, Victoria, Diana in Whistler, Canada. We're all the same as one another. We've got the same problem. We've got the same solution. One of the exercises I was shown from this book is read Bill W., write down 10 things from the first part of the book that you identify with, and five things after the kitchen table when he sits there with Ebby and goes, I've got religion, Bob. It's crazy, baby. Like, you know, like write down five things that you uh, dispute. Because if you identify with this crazy old dude in the, in the 1930s, war fever was high. I was in Winchester. I see a gravestone. <laughs> if you identify with that stuff, if you've got the same problem he had, then maybe the solution that he used will work for him. The simple truth is for us is that we identify at the point of our shared wound, our shared pain. But together, we will find a solution by serving one another, by loving one another. If you're anything like me, I sit there and I listen to chairs. I think, fuck you, what do you know, right? I think that a lot. But normally by the end of a chair, I think, oh, you're just another person, same as me. You're just another person trying to cope with life, same as me. Person that was born, person that was, that's going to die one day. And this program has taught me to feel that about everyone. I like Sometimes when I'm getting into a conflict or argument or something, I just think, that's just another person like me that's going to die one day. Just another person like me. You know, and if I if I knew the real them, then when they're on their own and crying and desperate, as one day we all must be, then I would love them and I would serve them. And like when we when I live in that point of view, then there is a God. The God is coming through. I feel it. I feel it. And that's the way I want to live. I don't want to live the godless, empty life of the alcoholic or drug addict. Me, I even need to have drugs and alcohol in sufficient quantities to bludgeon my poor, poor consciousness dead, or I need this program. And I need people like you, Lana, Railway Street, Peaches, Claire. This is what I need. You lot, you poor fuck-ups. Look at the state of yours all clinging on to life the same as me. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Vina. Seattle, Max.
anyway, listen, I suppose I'll end on this because I feel like, you know, I can't believe that any chair has been allowed to go on this. Like, I was told earlier on, if you can't fit into 15 minutes, it, someone told me if you're on 15 minutes, it's wanking. <laughs> and uh, for the Americans, that means jerking off. Beyond 50, if you're still talking <laughs> after 15 minutes. So you've seen 15 minutes of share and you've listened to 45 minutes of something. If I was actually doing it on a Zoom call with this many people, it would be cause for a prison sentence, let's face it. And I would do it with my head held high and I'd try and get myself on one of them wings where they do the program. But secretly they're brewing up hooch in their cell with bags of sugar and orange juice and that. Teach me how to make it with your lads. <laughs> no. I, one day at a time, I don't need to drink or drugs because I have people like you. So if you're in trouble, then think about these little things. Am I working the steps? Am I praying and meditating? Do I have a sponsor? Am I sponsoring people? What's my relationship like with my higher power? Am I being kind to myself? Am I recognizing that I'm not a bad person? That there's deep, deep beauty in me that I deserve to be here in this world. And there's a way back for me. There's a path back for me. I don't need to ever drink or use or hurt myself or anybody again if I don't want to. This program works if you work it, as they say. And as the great Sandy Beep said, um, the whole program could be reduced to this, let go and let God. The only power I have is the power to fuck it up. I have the power to fuck my own life up. I can turn any situation into a nightmare in about 15 seconds with my own head. That's my superpower, the power to ruin my own life. But this program is a effective tool for turn it's an alchemy program it turns lunatics into just adorable little sweethearts in cardigans offering you a cup of tea that's it people like that <laughs> people like where i go they're lunatics why mate do you want a cup of tea because <laughs> you're fucking hell you're a nutcase so um yeah give yourself a chance i love you you lot you poor desperate bastards Anyway, big kiss to all of you. And I don't know what happens now, but you can't possibly want me to carry on speaking. I think I've done the promises. I think I've done the steps. I've done a sort of review of the big book. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.